The following is a presentation of Marysville Exempted Village Schools. Right, that is going to. So, uh, welcome everybody to our August 20th, 2020 regular meeting of the Marysville Board of Education. Uh, we have started a little bit late due to some technical difficulties, but this live stream will be available for everyone, so uh, we appreciate their patience. Uh, can we start with the roll call, please? Mr. Luke? Here. Ms. Savage? Here. Ms. Power? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. Devine? Here. Thank you. And then if you will stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So let's see the first item here on our agenda. I've accepted a motion to adopt this agenda. So move. Motion by Ms. Powers. Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Roll call. Ms. Powers? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Luke? Yes. Ms. Savage? Yes. Ms. Devine? Yes. Motion carries. Next, we have a presentation from transportation on uh, routes, age of buses, and safety concerns. Hopefully. Route right. four. Hello everyone. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick transportation update. Uh, the good news is this will be short as we seem to have avoided the worst case scenario in routing that we discussed in July where we had traditional routes running multiple shuttles with kids arriving in waves. Uh, we will only have about 60% of the ridership that we had a year ago. Um, what this means is that we'll be able to adhere to the health department guidelines uh, and still um, still maintain route scheduling that is pretty close to uh, traditional scheduling. Um, this has not been an easy task and Tina has a, done a great job putting this puzzle together um, as the information has come in. Uh, it took a little longer than usual but routes have been distributed and drivers have been out this week learning those routes. Uh, and just a little more good news is that we actually are in pretty good shape in regards to staffing. Uh, finally, Tina and I have met with all the drivers throughout the week. Um, we were reviewing mask and COVID protocols, uh, cleaning procedures, and we discussed throughout the week uh, how important driver positivity is to this school year. Um, I've actually been very encouraged by these meetings. I believe the team is ready to go. Uh, and here is a short PSA that was put together uh, last week. We're excited to see you and can't wait to get you back on our buses and back in our classrooms. I'm going to show you a few changes that we've done this year. Uh, we're going to wear masks and how we're going to get on the bus. Uh, you'll have your masks on at your bus stops. We'll get on the buses one at a time. As you come in, you'll go straight to the very back of the bus. I'll have you sit down. You will have assigned seats. Make sure you keep your masks on the whole time you're on the bus, though, because that is very important. So just to show you that um, everybody has to wear the mask, the drivers will be wearing masks also. You will need to leave them on the whole time and they have to cover your nose and your mouth. Please keep them on. Do not change with your friends. Um, keep your hands to yourself. We will have uh, sanitizers on the bus if you need it. Um, the bus drivers will sanitize the handrails after each route when we're done. So we'll keep that sanitized. Our seats will be sanitized. Every Wednesday we'll do a deep clean, a deep sanitize before the next group comes in on Thursday and Friday and then Fridays we'll do another deep clean. So when we get to your bus stop, you're gonna get on the bus with your mask on one at a time. You'll go straight back to your assigned seat and I need you to stay in your seat till we get you to school. Keep your mask on the whole time you're getting on the bus and to your seat and while sitting there. Welcome back to school, Monarchs. Can't wait to see ya. It's gonna be a great year. Okay. 
Right. So that hopefully you've seen on social media and we've also uh, posted on the website several PSAs on mm -hmm. how to wear your face mask, uh, transportation, etc. Um, so we wanted to highlight that. But if you have not seen those, I encourage you to get on the website. They're posted on the front page as well as the hot button um, as we prepare for the year. So Tina and her team have um, really done a lot of work. Um, we've gone from scheduling every other seat, uh, one kid to a seat, to now, um, you know, our current um, order that Ryan was referencing, and it has been a continual evolution, um, you know, that uh, now we will not have to run shuttles across uh, different schools. Um, we'll be able to handle that um, for two reasons, because the orders changed. And um, we've had a significant number of families uh, elect to take their children to school, which has been a significant help to us given the restrictions. So um, kids will obviously need to wear their masks. Um, I think uh, Ryan's note about positivity and how we interact with students will be important. Um, if there is an issue with a student, we have discussed that <clears throat> that student will be in a uh, if the student does not have a mask and refuses to put a mask on for whatever reason, that the important thing is to get people to school. So there will be space left in the front of the bus, and um, then the principal will deal with those situations if they were to arise. But for the, there will be extra masks if a student happens to forget. Um, you know, we'll have those available as well to start the day. So they won't have to stress about running back home or anything like that. So I couldn't uh, thank them enough for it's been a heavy, heavy lift. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, that's, I, I couldn't be more grateful for all the work that Tina has done and her staff, all the bus drivers. And uh, I think that's going to be so important for those kids when they're getting on the bus to see the smiling faces and, you know, just kind of feel like, okay, we're back to school and, you know, it's close to normal as it can be. And I can't even imagine how crazy trying to do those routes was. Yeah. So when, when Ryan said uh, mentioned the importance of positivity, was that was he thinking of positivity of drivers to students, or was it drivers to the whole situation, the craziness and the changes and the, all that? Like, what, what? I would say both. I would say we also recognize the fact that a bus driver's role is very important because really they forecast how the whole day may go, and we've always encouraged. You know, good morning, those kind of things. But especially in this atmosphere, we know it might be challenging to have kids wear masks and things like that. So uh, really how you deal with those situations and stay positive about them and encouraging about them makes a difference for uh, students as well. So I think it's both directions. Yeah, I remember back in the spring, you were saying that transportation uh, was one of the two major problems that we were going to have to deal with. And so it's nice that over the summer there were a number of changes in the circumstances and so forth. Uh, I know there were lots of plans that were put together that were scrapped uh, as they went through this process. Um, so I'm, I'm excited that we reached a point where we're going to be uh, confident uh, moving forward, that we're going to get the kids to school or get, get them to school safely. I definitely thank all of those parents who, who are able to help out. Yes, it's been significant for us. Okay, uh, next up. I don't think we have any public participation. We did not. All right, then we can move right on to reports. Uh, Nan, do you have a high point report? Yep, um, just a few quick things. Uh, Mr. Logan Brown, he's with the Logan County Sheriff's Department, is the new SRO for High Point. So um, we switched um, resource officers. Um, big item is uh, getting ready for the restart. Um, High Point is going to do juniors on Monday and Wednesday, and seniors on Tuesday and Thursday, and then every other Friday. Um, it's kind of a rotating schedule. Their key focus point is um, making sure that 
the students get the hours they need for college credit and earning credentials. So that was one of their key focus items. Uh, had another update on the construction project. Um, kind of a difficult project. We had to, High Point had to hire an attorney um, to negotiate between the construction and the architectural firms to get the price point back where it was supposed to be to begin with. So um, it's getting back on track now, but that's going to be um, probably Dr. Smith's full-time job for this next coming year. Um, we finished the uh, evaluations for the superintendent and the treasurer at High Point, and we uh, did a little bit of working on goal, goal setting for next year. Again, we're building flexibility in, it's going to be require a lot of flexibility uh, on the part of everyone at their location also. Um, bit of good news, um, the Sloan trustees um, gave uh, High Point $138,000 for additional equipment and they had $62,000 left over from last year and they went ahead and rolled that back in back to them so they didn't take that back. Oh, nice. So $200,000 for additional equipment for High Point. Okay. Any questions or comments? Okay. Uh, superintendent report. Okay, I um, want to highlight some things. I want to uh, remind everyone uh, and all of you as well to um, access the uh, return to school button. There's tons of information there. We have sent that to parents in different ways, but just a reminder for us all to access that. We have updated for example, a uh, lunch program for hybrid, and if you're a free and reduced lunch kid or any kid, you could, um, how you can schedule to pick up those meals. So we'll make meals available um, if you come on Monday or Tuesday. We make meals available for Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and vice versa. If you're a virtual student, there's also uh, the ability as well. So all that information is uh, has been sent to parents and is also in and on the website. Um, I also mentioned the public service announcements. Um, hopefully you've also seen the HOPE videos that are going out from staff. Uh, so we're excited about those um, and getting some great feedback on that as well. I did want to tell you thus far, we have received and approved six waivers for masks. Um, as you remember, the there's a, a, a very um, set set of standards established by the governor, um, and we've received six waiver applications that have been approved. Um, I, just as a general reminder, preschool is not required, and this year we're, we are, um, preschool is not required to wear masks, and this year we are uh, hosting our own preschool in Mill Valley um, in order to help with some space issues at Harold Lewis. Um, I think we have five kids uh, at my last count. I would have to go back and check that for accuracy, um, but that they are not required by the governor's um, mandate to wear masks. But we will try to do some things with those students to um, encourage mask wearing and work on that skill as well, but that it is not a requirement for that age group. Um, this evening, I, and I know you received an email from Jonathan, we have some board policies that are um, not typical in that we're not doing two reads. Um, and, and really, um, I'm sure you all read that email, but the rationale is, you know, it has taken <coughs> um, the people who do policy for us a while to create that policy. So that policy was, um, given to us, I think, one week. The next week, the policy committee uh, reviewed the, the policies, and this week, you're approving it, hopefully approving them. They're up for approval, specifically around Title IX and the addition um, uh, to Title IX. So um, that would bring us all into compliance um, as well. So um, I think it was sexual harassment that was added to Title IX. Um, 
for that. So hopefully, um, if, and if I remember, I, I think the legislation wasn't even passed until the end of May. I believe it was the end of May with, with an effective date, the middle of August. Correct. So there really wasn't a lot of time in there for the policy to be written up. And, and one of those policies is 11 pages long. So Correct. <laughs> that, it takes a while to. Yeah. It was yeah. significant, so yeah. it's more of a timing issue. We have talked with legal, and we are fine to approve it tonight, even though the effective date is August 4th, 14th, I 14th, think. 14th, yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Yesterday, um, and I sent to you today a copy of a PowerPoint. Um, we engaged with all district leadership and all building leadership in a table tap exercise with the Department of Health that really ran through different uh, scenarios um, with COVID to kind of give us a sense of what that contact tracing would look like or how the reporting system may look. And um, the biggest thing I can say is there's no one size fits all. Uh, we all need to remember it seems like each one of these cases is so situational, but they did try to step us through a variety. For example, if an employee would tell us as opposed to them, if they knew first, if uh, they talked us through why some classrooms would be more susceptible to having quarantines than other classrooms. And so we kind of walked through a variety of those and I would, everyone thought it was very valuable. So we have posted that PowerPoint also to the hot button, but I shared it with you uh, just for some general information. Uh, along those lines, I would tell you um, as expected, I, I think I was pretty clear, but uh, we were informed today of our first um, positive uh, um, COVID uh, uh, employee. So um, that uh, staff has been notified. Anyone who um, needs to be quarantined has been notified. So um, we would expect that that would not be our last, but um, just wanted to put you on notice as well for that. Um, let's see. I also wanted to talk briefly um, about a situation that has, oh, before that, you have uh, two MOUs I want to talk about. Um, we have been working, yes? Be before you do that, you, we had our goal meeting the other day, and at that time, you talked about creating a dashboard yep. to let the community know. And as we have our first COVID, is that going to be? It will be. Our dashboard isn't up and running yet. Yes, yeah, um, I, knew, I knew that was a work in progress. Yep. But yeah, we have a, a rough framework. We're trying to make it a little more than just COVID, mm -hmm. um, but we want to. What we're trying to do right now is put a new staff member on there to the district, as well as a, a kind of a, a COVID framework, like staff impacted, students impacted, um, but um, add a little more to that dashboard than just one thing. Yeah. Um, so we're close to final on okay. that. So I probably can share something with you um, even over the weekend as we fine tune it. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Uh, we were able to set up two MOUs that are on the agenda tonight for your consideration. The first MOU is really just a general sense of how work has changed as a result uh, with uh, the teachers union. Um, and really just highlighting the things the district is committing to, the t things that a teacher is responsible for. Um, I can't say enough about the strong collaboration in order to um, come up with this piece. We, we talked a lot about, there are several MOUs going around this state, but we did talk a lot about what was important to Marysville, and I think that we landed on a, a really nice quality um, document. That being said, I would draw your attention to number seven. Um, it, it does have a little bit of a, a typo. Um, it says any teacher who is, um, let me find that. Okay, teachers are expected to wear a mask while they are on district property unless they are working alone in a workspace. So you're in a classroom, no one else is there. Similar to here, if Todd and I are in our office, 
Mm -hmm. You can pull your mask down. Or um, if you're able to maintain six feet social distancing when you're outside, mm -hmm. your copy says um, unable to maintain, and it should be able to maintain. Uh, I have a correct version in front of me that will be the official signature. So I just wanted to highlight that change. Sorry, Dan, did those waivers that you talked about earlier, were they students or staff? The, there are waivers for staff as well that run through uh, Lynette, and um, we've only had one waiver for a staff member. So the ones that you mentioned that were approved were students? students. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other piece is uh, we've talked at length about um, last spring, I don't think anyone felt great uh, about what to do about spring supplementals and how to make sense of that. So we've spent some time working with union leadership uh, and looking at what I would call kind of this graduated scale. So if a season were not uh, in fact able to come to fruition, that coaches would still um, be compensated for uh, a portion of the work that they completed uh, without having to institute a RIF like we did uh, last spring. And I think everyone, um, Todd was a part of that, Lynette as well. And I think that that was a, a highly um, collaborative. One of the things we talked about were head coaches this summer had a, a bigger burden than ever with uh, new strategies and trying to figure out uh, how you know stations were going to work and limiting at, 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 if you remember initially we were only 10 mm -hmm. students per staff member mm -hmm. so um, <coughs> so we have um, feel pretty good about uh, that as well um, and would you add anything to that time uh, no, they just I think it was a collaborative, you know, just, you know, with the members of the administrative side and multiple members from the, uh, the union side as well as the athletic director. Uh, I think we came up with a, uh, an option that kind of works for everybody. Yeah. That recognizes the work they've put in thus far as well. I was pleased that this particular LOU also carried through at least the principles that we applied in the spring yeah it's very similar not yeah. exactly but we try to keep the same yeah. kind of idea yeah. yeah okay um so i would also like to take a couple minutes uh really in about the half hour before our meeting i was made aware of a situation involving a photograph uh, that is on social media um and just wanted to take a couple of minutes to kind of tell you that we're looking at that situation now gathering facts and information um and and i, I here i guess in general i kind of wrote down some thoughts uh, so i'll read a little bit i don't need to be impersonal but i just want to make sure that i i've said kind of what's heavy on my heart a little bit i think it's easy to rush to judgment uh, especially right now with how polarizing some events are in our society so we have worked diligently in this district to practice an inclusive school culture. As such, it is important to understand that intent can't always be measured uh, or evaluated in a picture. It's also important to understand and recognize that a symbol or a flag can mean one thing to you and something to the person sitting beside you. So it's that call to being empathetic and understanding uh, about the way we you know, even communicate and the things that, that we put out in order to not be offensive uh, sometimes to others. Uh, I, in my initial take of all of this, I do think this is a very teachable moment um, and, and a great opportunity for us and a reminder for us to practice empathy and how other people may interpret some things that, that we do. I would also like to say, sorry, like to say that we'll continue to look into it. I. I cannot tell you that I fully investigated because that would not be accurate. So I will, um, I'm going to engage with coaches and, and the admin at the high school and see, um, you know, what we can get to, um, get to the bottom of and under, get a deeper understanding for, for what has transpired. Um, 
you know, I, I tell you guys all the time and we've talked openly about this sense of, um, you know, sometimes there's one side of the story and another side of the story and somewhere in between lies really what's transpired. So if you can kind of let me have some time to get to that and have some conversations uh, and then I'll, I'll be in touch with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's all I have. Oh, I lied. That's, you got, do you have the nurse? Or yeah, I do have okay. uh, the nurse video, and I did want to give you guys a little bit of an update. I'm oh, sorry. Uh, okay. um, we had talked at length about the number of staff who had requested leave, so I wanted right. to give you an update. So okay. um, Lynette and I uh, went through this today. Uh, so you know we had 69 initial responses uh, for when I talk uh, staff I'm inclusive of everyone not just teachers not just bus drivers everyone um, so there were 69 initial requests um, now understand that's also FMLA and maternity and there were all different reasons for those requests so um, Currently, we have 23 FMLA requests. Six are intermittent, which might mean um, they, it, it, they might have a couple appointments in one month, but not again for another month, but it is the same issue. And 17 of those are long-term leave. Um, FMLA from the beginning of the year, and, and that would be prior to September, we had three. Uh, and ones that are on the cusp, so they're upcoming and haven't happened yet. So I would say from September to the spring, we have an additional 14. And again, it's a variety of option, uh, reasons. So uh, the, um, the Response Act it is really was formulated as a response to COVID, the FFCRA. Um, it, we have three of those uh, thus far. These are um, approved requests due to quarantine symptoms, ch child care issues, those kind of things. Um, virtual, we've been able to accommodate 24 staff members in a virtual platform. Um, so we feel pretty good about that. So while teachers are in that virtual platform, I think it's important to understand there seems to be some confusion those those teachers are still receiving full pay and not having to take sick leave so um, we were able to make those accommodations some of the other 69 we can make classroom accommodations maybe there was just a, something uh, an extra divider required by their uh, doctor or something in order to uh, make it a safer environment for that employee so we've been able to accommodate some in that way as well Sorry about that, sorry, I forgot. The last uh, thing I wanted to show you, um, I, Megan put this together for the staff and I thought it would be nice for you guys to see as well some of the things that were happening as a part of our, our daily practice and expectations with staff and students. The district has implemented multiple layers of protection based upon local, state, and national guidance. The processes for these prevention measures will be discussed throughout this PowerPoint. Symptoms of COVID-19. Per the Ohio Department of Health, you may have COVID-19 if you experience one or more of the following. This list does not include all symptoms. Also, there's individuals who may not have any symptom at all. However, it is important to be knowledgeable of this list to be able to self-monitor. At-home risk assessment. The at-home risk assessment promotes keeping students and staff at home if they have a possible current illness and can assist in determining the risk for transmission to others. So every morning, students and staff will ask themselves questions from section one and section two. So section one is regarding symptoms in the past 24 hours, and section two is regarding transmission and close contact. So if you answer yes to any of the questions in section one or section two, what do you do? If an individual answers yes to any question in section one and no to every question in section two, 
They will monitor symptoms at home and be excused from school until symptom free for 24 hours without using fever reducing medications. If an individual answers yes to any question in section one and yes to any question in section two, they will be referred for evaluation by their healthcare provider and possible testing. When to return to school will be dependent on test results or lack of test results, or if they're considered a close contact. All students and staff should stay at home if sick. Follow care instructions from your healthcare provider and local health department. All students and staff will be required to complete an at-home risk assessment and should follow guidance to stay home. If a student or staff member becomes ill at school, he or she will be immediately separated from others and sent home. If you are positive for COVID-19 or are required to quarantine, you will need to notify your principal and human resources. To prevent potential exposure, the clinics will be separated into two entities, the clean clinic and the waiting room. The clean clinic will be used for chronic condition visits, medications, injuries, daily visits, and for any visit that is not related to COVID symptoms. Students who are receiving care in the clean clinic may be a part of a population may have more severe complications if they are exposed to COVID. It is very important to limit the number of students sent to the clean clinic. The waiting room will be used for students who present to the clinic with symptoms in section one. These students will be monitored in the designated room until parents arrive. We ask that staff do not check in on students in the waiting room or clean clinic. Staff must call the clinic before sending a student unless in the event of an emergency. Note that this is not an exclusive list of when to send students to the clinic. Please make your best judgment, be aware of your student health condition list, review your student's emergency action plans, and always call the clinic if unsure. To reduce the number of visits to the clean clinic, we ask you to review the examples of students who do not need to be sent to the clinic. You will be provided with a resource on how students can complete self-care in the classroom. As of August 14th, a new health order for K-12 schools has been issued pertaining to facial coverings. The order has been provided as a reference for you to review. Key points of this director's order include that staff are required to wear facial coverings by law. Exceptions are when an individual is seated and actively eating or drinking, if your job responsibility requires you to wear a face shield, if you are working alone in an enclosed space, or when you are outside and able to safely social distance. Please note that if your job responsibility requires you to wear a face shield without a facial covering, you will be notified. In addition, if an individual comes into your enclosed workspace where you're working alone, you must wear a mask. For students, all students must wear facial coverings with the following exceptions. Teacher directed mask break in which students can safely social distance. Students are outside and can safely social distance. Student has a face mask exemption or when students are seated and actively eating or drinking. Facial coverings will be worn while using district transportation and when waiting for district transportation if unable to so safely social distance. Again, social distancing is not an alternative to wearing a cloth face mask. You must comply to both preventative measures concurrently. Properly wearing a facial covering. First, wash your hands before putting on your mask. Inspect your mask. If damaged or dirty, wear a different mask. Place the cloth mask over your nose, mouth, and secure it under your chin. Ensure your mask fits snugly against the sides of your face and you can breathe easily. Avoid touching your mask. If you do touch your mask, wash your hands immediately. Before removing your mask, wash your hands. Only touch the ear loops when removing and pull the mask away from your face. If you'll be wearing your mask again, place it in a plastic bag or a brown bag labeled with your name. Wash your hands immediately after. Masks should be washed daily or more frequently if soiled. These are the don'ts of wearing a facial covering. Do not use a mask that looks damaged. Do not wear a loose mask. Do not wear the mask under the nose. Your mask should always cover your nose, mouth, and be secured under your chin at all times. 
Do not remove the mask when you are unable to safely social distance. Do not use a mask that is difficult to breathe through. Do not wear a dirty or wet mask. Do not share your mask with others. In addition, your mask should never be hanging off one ear or around your neck. If you need to take it off, place it in a plastic bag or a brown paper bag labeled with your name on it. Students should be following these same techniques. Therefore, it is important to model and reiterate these techniques in the classroom. Please ensure your students have a labeled plastic bag or brown bag to store their masks while at lunch or during breaks. Face shields provide protection of the eyes from respiratory droplet sprays. Per the Ohio Department of Health, face shields must wrap around the sides of the wearer's face and extend below the chin. If a face shield does not meet this criteria, it cannot be worn. Only use the headband to put on or take off your face shield. Avoid the front of the face shield as it is contaminated. Reusable face shields should be cleaned when dirty or at the end of the day. If recommendations have not been provided by the manufacturer, you can follow the CDC recommendation to clean your face shield. Please note that this is for reusable face shields and not disposable face shields. The directions have been provided in this slide for you to reference. Hand hygiene cannot be stressed enough. It is very important to wash hands frequently and reiterate this education to students to reduce the spread of germs. Please review the key times to wash hands and view the World Health Organization's video on how to wash your hands. Please note that washing your hands is best, but hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol can be used when your hands are not visibly dirty. When using hand sanitizer, you should use the same scrub technique as washing your hands, which should take about 20 seconds. All staff and students are expected to maintain a six foot space between them to the greatest extent possible. Maintaining social distance is vital in reducing transmission. In addition, someone who was within six feet of an infected person for at least 15 minutes starting from two days before illness onset may be considered a close contact by the health department. Social distancing must be stressed when facial coverings are not being worn, for instance, during mass breaks or when outside. This is a basic overview on disinfecting surfaces. Items that are considered frequently touched should be disinfected throughout the day. When disinfecting, it is important to keep the following items in mind. Use the appropriate disinfectant that kills the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Read the manufacturer's directions. Ensure appropriate contact time. Most disinfectants need 10 minute contact time, meaning that the surface must remain wet for 10 minutes before being wiped. Wear gloves and lock cleaning supplies after use. This concludes the presentation on COVID-19 guidance for staff. Thank you for watching. Perfect. And that was one piece. Our staff certainly has received a lot of professional development this week, but uh, just to give you an idea of expectations uh, as well. Yes. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. So the, um, the self-assessment, that everybody's supposed to do before they come in. Is that going to be checked by the teachers when the kids come in, or is it more like an honor system? It's an uh, the recommendation from uh, health department is an honor system. Okay, and then um, when the for the mask requirement, is there are there limitations on what kind of masks? Like there was just a study that came out about these neck gaiters. What are they called? Neck gaiters. Yeah, have you seen that? That's just one study though. It was thinking that maybe they're not as effective? Or do you, have you looked at any of that? No, and the, the guidance at this time is a cloth covering okay. uh, from CDC, so they haven't given us. You cannot replace a, um, a shield for a mask, mm -hmm. so you have to wear both, and really what we're talking to our staff about is the idea of two layers of protection. So the mask is one, six foot distan distancing is the second, if you're uh, maybe doing small, uh, some kind of uh, reading instruction, uh, you know, barriers could substitute in for some of those, or barriers could be an additional layer. But the, the general rule and the guidance we've uh, received from Union County is we're working hard to maintain two of those barriers um, as much as possible.
would would time be considered another barrier then? Like time is not a necessarily a barrier. Okay. So the barriers are um, mostly distancing. Right. Uh, you know, if you're outside, that goes into the equation. Mm -hmm. uh, the physical. I should have brought some of the dividers in, and I could probably run down and get one in a little bit. Could be a barrier <clears throat> as well. So. A lot of information. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay. And Todd, of the Treasury Report. Uh, I just wanted to talk briefly about the uh, one of the uh, agenda items. There's a resolution for approval of um, a CRA, which stands for Community Reinvestment Act. Um, this is just another type of uh, tax incentive that the city uses to entice uh, businesses uh, into the community. Um, you know, as we've done in the past, we look at each of these uh, based on their own merits and, and you know, make decisions based on that. Um, my recommendation would be to approve uh, this CRA. Um, there's a, a company that would be uh, building basically some office space. Uh, on the Route 33 corridor and that, that technology area. Uh, this would be a 10-year, 75% um, uh, incentive, uh, which means that for the next 10-year, uh, once, that, once that starts, once the building starts, then they've got that 10-year period where so they would basically be getting a 75% discount on their taxes. Um, the estimate is that uh, the taxes generated would be about $130,000, so that means about $100,000 would be the discount. The district would still get $30,000 per year, which is which would be new money, uh, so that's based on projections. And then there's also a uh, revenue, income tax revenue sharing piece uh, where some of the income tax revenue that would be generated by employees in this area. Uh, the city would have to share some of that with the district, which equates, again, based on an estimate uh, of approximately $10,000 per year once they reach uh, their projected payroll levels. Um, and then another potential benefit, uh, which is you know kind of kind of out there, but um, the uh, the cog that we um, um, we meet with each month, the the city, the county, and the school. Uh, Mainly, mainly for uh, our fiber or internet connectivity. Um, there's a potential that this, this same building uh, would eventually house our uh, data center, which is a, a, an important piece for the COG to actually start generating revenues. So that's another piece of this, um, this building that could potentially uh, benefit the school district in the future. I know um, in some of the additional information that you sent out to us, there was also um, this hopeful, hopefully planned automotive mobility innovation center, like an acronym of AMIC, that you know they said they would they plan to use like 18,000 square feet and partnering partnering with the Ohio State, the COG, the UC Port Authority, the city, and the county, and uh, you know I, and also in this agreement, they it's nice they include that little blurb about trying to find ways to partner with the schools as well with internship opportunities and so. Um, you know, with that smart mobility and innovation and technology, that really um, fits nicely, I think, in with our curriculum and some good opportunity, potential opportunities for our students and, and just people in the community in general. So, yeah, one of the things uh, I mentioned earlier uh, that Diane had said transportation was one of the big issues facing the district this past spring. The other very significant issue that still remains a big issue is internet connectivity. And so uh, I see this and, and the possibility, uh, whether it comes to fruition or not, at least this creates a possibility of making some movement that might lead at some point to greater connectivity that would benefit our students and, and the uh, families in our school districts. So that's, like I said, it's a possibility. Uh, hopefully, it, it will fit in. That's Anything all. else? Okay. Okay. Uh, for 
for my report. Uh, I just sent out, you know, sent a couple things about student achievement, sent something kind of in the middle of the month that was uh, focused on that positivity idea that we heard about in the transportation and just the importance uh, for parents, for staff, for board members, anybody um, to, to really um, be a good role model for our kids. And, and I know in our special meeting on Tuesday, you know, Amy brought up the fact how this can be a, um, even though it's challenging, our kids are really learning some important um, characteristics this year, you know, just important things to learn how to be resilient and that life isn't always going to be easy and, um, you know, don't get down. You just kind of just keep putting one foot in front of the other. So, so anyways, for my student achievement report, um, I noticed I, I've got a quote in there, the single most common factor for children who develop resilience is at least one stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent, caregiver, or other adult. In other words, your care and compassion will nurture their resilience. Just our presence in their lives is a strengthening force. So I, I know our staff is going to do a great job with that. And then uh, I sent the August success, and, and that had a little research section that was talking about the benefits of teacher looping. I know some of our buildings have done that before, and um, you know it'll just be interesting to see with this COVID and just that importance of having relationships with students and. Uh, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, then again, we, we had that we had our special meeting on Tuesday to review and revise our work plan. Um, thought we had some really good discussion. Also went over the superintendent and treasurer's goals, and our revised work plan is going to be on our agenda for approval a little bit later. Um, as part of that discussion, we did talk a little bit about our board meetings. I know we have had uh, we had one other in-person meeting several months ago and then since then our meetings have been virtual so you know here we are tonight and we're socially distancing hopefully we're following the guidelines that we've been watching up there um, but you know just just wanted to have maybe a little bit more conversation or maybe uh, if we hear if people are watching these uh, meetings if there are comments do they have a preference do they like it better when we zoom and they can see our faces or you know, is it hard to understand with our masks on, things like that. So I guess maybe just kind of keep our ears open. Um, and then the other, uh, the other thought was whether, at what point are we going to allow media or if people want to have public participation, when would we allow them to come in as well? And obviously in this room, we don't have the space to socially distance and have anybody else. Um, and I don't really want to even think about going into a school building right now when we're just bringing students back in for the first time, but at some point, you know, maybe considering a bigger room out of high school that could, could be a dedicated board meeting room this year as a possibility so that we could bring other people in. But um, again, just wanted to throw that out there as food for thought and kind of be considering that as, as we go through the next couple months. Um, Let's see. Okay, and then also the reminder, uh, you should be getting an email on your Ohio ethics law training. That was new legislation this year that requires um, a variety of uh, elected officials to go through this elected uh, Ohio ethics training. Um, but as board members, we fell into that uh, group. So uh, once you get that email, it's, it's not a real long training, but um, it's a good reminder of things that we need to be aware of. And then also, OSPA is offering a virtual workshop on August 27th from 9 to 345, and it's strategies surrounding development projects and kind of uh, trying to focus on having good working relationships with your city. And uh, I thought with all the development that's going on in, in Marysville and Union County, uh, if somebody would be interested in attending that, I, I may be signing up myself, but um, again, it's just a virtual workshop, so wanted to make you aware of that. And if you look at the OSBA briefcase, they always have uh, more information about those workshops. It, it actually has the whole agenda for the day. And that's, that's it for my report. And I know uh, Mr. Smith sent out a notice that as our legislators are on uh, vacation or on break that there is no legislative report tonight. The, the governor's statements and other things uh, yeah. uh, which were 
acutely aware of. Exactly. So. Okay. And any safety report? Yes. If you could pass those around. So just following up on some pending legislation, um, which is still in consideration, um, the HB 674 is the Sunday liquor license. Um, if you look through there, it'll kind of clear that out for you. So it's eliminating some of the existing requirements. Um, the HB 674 also allows for two new permit types. The J permit, which allow a business to sell alcohol until 4 a.m., and K permits, which allow for alcohol 24-7 if approved by the local voters. Then it uh, goes on to House Bill 669, makes into law some of the exceptions that are being allowed during the pandemic. You will see that that will include allowing restaurants to serve patrons outside of their establishment, uh, sidewalks, parking lots, other areas. Um, the coalition is having a little bit of problem with that because they said it limits the server's ability to monitor their customers and to monitor who is actually receiving the drink. So from the coalition's perspective, they feel that there's part of these bills that go a little bit too far and create a burden for local communities. So we've got some several of the teams from the summer program at PASS have written letters uh, to the legislators and concern regarding how the impact of these bills on public health and safety and shared some of their experience of having family members with alcohol use disorder and what it's created in their family. So um, I put in here the contact information from our representatives if you feel like that you need to write them then you can do this and I give you all the information there. The next page is uh, no teens in disguise to buy alcohol. So they've had several situations where kids have been, uh, one was one dressed up like an older lady put on a mask and they really thought it was an older lady going in to buy alcohol and she was able to purchase that, purchase that alcohol. So on the second page of that, um, you can see about the weed, the vaping, um, what percentage of drinking has been going on in the last 30 days with schools, the problems, social problems, legal, physical, disruption. Um, so what they're saying is that we've got to be real careful at this time that these kids are not going into binge drinking. So there's parents' tips on the third page and that is all I have. Okay. So, is, um, do they have a website or something? Yes, okay. if you go there on the last page, uh -huh. okay, you can go to the Mental Health and Addiction Services, okay, okay. and then um, you can also go into the PreventionActionAlliance.org. Okay. Okay. So that's what they're really looking at right now with all the changes that are happening in the city and with the pandemic and everything and kids being out, um, you know, that's, right. that's their concern at this point. Okay, well it's, so we kind of had a little bit of a legislative report. Yes. You. <laughs> <laughs> Those have not gone through yet, they're just right. pending. Right. Okay. So, you know, if you feel the need to, to put some, something in there, right. yeah, okay. then feel free to do so. Thank you very much. And actually, I'm sorry, we're not at order here. It was supposed to be your report. That's okay. Bits, we're good. All right. Uh, next up on our agenda, I would accept a motion to approve the minutes from our July 16th regular meeting and our uh, August 18th special meeting. So moved. Motion by Ms. Savage. Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Any comments, revisions, questions about the minutes? Then roll call, please. Ms. Savage. Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Root? Yes. Ms. Power? Yes. Ms. Devine? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next, we have our Board of Education items. Um, and uh, it's, they are all on there together. So unless somebody feels strongly about separating them, uh, I would accept a motion to approve our Board of Education Goals and Work Plan, the uh, COVID-19 resolution, MOU that Diane talked about, and the COVID-19 supplemental resolution. So moved. Motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Ms. Savage. We have comments? Uh, just that the board goals will be posted on the 
school's website, so if someone wants to go in and look at them along with our protocol, they're on the uh, front page there. Okay, thank you. Just to follow up on the, um, the MOU, Todd, so I, I took in that the process was collaborative, and would you also say that the coaches in general are aware of this and have been informed about what the plan is? Well, I don't know, it would be up to the... They, they had to vote, yeah. so they uh, it was sent to membership and voted on. Uh, two days ago. Yes, yeah, speaking, I'd like to speak to, to both. The first, the work okay. plan. Uh, I thought that a work session that we had, and we spent a considerable time going over goals for the for the district and, and talking about uh, uh, all of the different issues that have come up and how those fit into the goals and objectives we have. I really appreciate the work that uh, that Nan did uh, in taking all the ideas that were shared and modifying some of the goals. Uh, people look at those; they may not notice a lot of change, but uh, uh, the goals need to be rather general and overarching. Um, and uh, uh, I think we've really targeted the kinds of things that we need to, to focus on. And, and the biggest parts of it that I took away from the meeting the other day was the fact that we need as a school board to be prepared to do whatever is in our power to support the teachers uh, and uh, our administrators, particularly building administrators, uh, as they deal with all of the individual situations that are going to occur. because. Just as parents and students have a lot of unknowns coming into this, so do they. And so I hope, I sincerely hope, that all of the, all the teachers and the building administrators feel that the school board it has their back in this situation. That we know they're going to be challenged. We know they're going to uh, you know, face those challenges uh, diligently and that they're going to do a, an absolutely amazing job. We have great confidence in that. On the uh, MOUs, um, I've been involved in discussions of MOUs and relationships and contract uh, negotiations and all those kinds of things years back. And it is critical uh, for our district that the uh, teachers association, teachers union, uh, and the board are able, uh, through the superintendent and the treasurer, to have good, open communication. And I really appreciate all the groundwork that was laid for these MOUs by the communication that occurred beginning back in the spring uh, and coming forward uh, by involving uh, teachers asking teachers surveys, you know, what their concerns are, what their opinions are, certainly helps to lay the groundwork of trust that has to exist before you can come and address the kinds of issues that these two MOUs do. And so I'm really excited that, that we were able to come to uh, an agreement, and uh, I think this kind of clears the decks to be able to move forward and, and know that everybody is, is on the same page. So, excited for that. Yeah, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to make a comment about the, uh, the work plan. So, these plans give us a chance to set some goals for ourselves for the coming year, but they are also a chance to check in with each other about our basic values and principles. And I wanted, I know they'll be available to read, but I just wanted to say and let uh, parents and teachers and administrators hear that all five of us agreed that health and safety of staff and students are a primary concern for us this year. That's number one. We all agreed on that. Secondly, that we also agreed that all of our educational goals, that we, we expect those to be fulfilled as well. So it's not an either or. It's a both end. 
we're not going to sacrifice kids' health or teachers' health, but we're not going to back off of our educational goals either. And all five of us agreed to that, and we put it in our work statement. I think that's important for people to know. Yep. And I think um, that's, you know, we added that kind of an extra preamble or just kind of a statement at the very beginning of that work plan um, really to address what you, what you just said. So um, I, I can't, I really appreciate uh, I mean, it, it's clear that we're all on the same page, and um, so I think your statements have been wonderful, and I think it, it's a, just a nice, I want to say, I mean, it just, I, I hope people appreciate um, how sincerely we do care about everything that's going on right now, and I know I've run into a couple of teachers just in the last two days and just said, you know, hey guys, we, we appreciate what you do. We realize that there are so many unknowns out there and flexibility is going to be key. So, Any other comments? Okay, then roll call. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Savage? Yes. Mr. Luke? Yes. Ms. Power? Yes. Ms. Devine? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next, I would accept a motion to approve the Marysville CRA resolution. So moved. Moved by Ms. Savage. Second. Second by Ms. Powers. Any questions or comments? Other than, I mean, I know you made a few comments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Uh, I, I asked a question earlier because at one place in this uh, it talks about the length of time covering, I think, mm -hmm. 17 years. And Todd explained to me that they have the agreement begins when construction begins and the 17 years allows you know creates a definitive beginning and end point so within that period of time the agreement would be in force for 10 of those, right. those years right. so. for, because it's kind of tentatively two phases in right. there so yeah. right. right and it is for and it's it's the uh, innovation park that you see when you're when you get on 33 going towards dublin right. I, I, I know Todd does a lot of research on this. Uh, he made uh, mention of the fact that we look at each one of these individually mm -hmm. and uh, try to assess what the impact is on the school district and make a determination as to whether that's something, if the impact is something that we can support mm -hmm. or whether it creates significant enough issues for us that we would not feel comfortable doing that. So. But as a district, we obviously know that our community needs to grow. It's important that businesses and industry locate here that uh, help to uh, support the schools and support everything else in our community. And we certainly want to see Marysville grow in the right way. So we have been tasked as a school board to make sure that we make sure that the impact on the school districts uh, negative impacts are kept to a minimum. So, yeah, and I think uh, I might also want to just mention that Eric Phillips. I know he he works uh, diligently on economic development, and I think we're fortunate to have him in our mm -hmm. community. And uh, some of that information that he provided to Todd, I think, you know, clearly outlines the, the benefits to our community as a whole. And, and while we know that um, for 10, 17 years or so, we're going to be uh, passing up some potential tax revenue, I mean, it's, uh, as Todd also said, we're going to get some money that we're not getting right now, so yeah. I think it's a good, yeah, good deal. Okay. Any other questions or comments? And roll call, please. Ms. Savage? Yes. Ms. Powers? Yes. Mr. Luke? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Devine? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next, I would approve a motion to, uh, I would accept a motion to approve the Treasurer CFO action items. So I'm moved. Motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Ms. Powers. Any comments? Uh, a couple things. Uh, so these are the July financials. Uh, July is the, the first year of fiscal, the first month of uh, fiscal year 21. So we've got an updated cash flow. Um, we have appropriations. Uh, these are main thing on there. Some some of the grants. Uh, that we've, we've already talked about, but we're just now getting them uh, appropriated into the budget. Uh, we've got the 500, 507 fund, that's the ESSER grant, $298,000. That's going to be used for staffing costs uh, as a result to uh, 
kind of make up for the cut in state funding. Uh, we've got the 510 CRF grant, $275,000. That's kind of uh, basically our PPE grant that's going to be used for those kinds of things, as well as um, items related to remote learning that were needed to be purchased. Uh, also, uh, our student wellness and success money. Um, we've that, that's, that was new money last year, and so now we, we've, it's been allocated that we are going to be receiving money again this year. That's not the full amount. The number is actually, um, now off the top of my head, I don't know, it's in the 400,000, so, so it's a bigger number than that. We'd already um, had some of it allocated based on um, carryover from last year. Um, and also a couple other items. Um, wanted to note uh, that we're asking for approval uh, of a reimbursement for a teacher. Uh, it's kind of a unique situation, but at the same time, it's apparently not that unique because the auditor has already kind of put out a frequently asked questions, and this is one of them. So due to, due to COVID, we're not the only person, only, only district having this issue. Uh, she had purchased a ticket, plane tickets for a school trip using her personal card, and then the, the school trip obviously got canceled. Uh, so this is just to um, reimburse that teacher for that. Um, the, the tickets were purchased using fundraiser dollars. Uh, so just wanted to get approval just to make sure we don't have any issues with the audit. Uh, and then also the, the, another uh, resolution that's on there um, is uh, to join a lawsuit uh, against a pharmaceutical company. Um, basically the gist of the lawsuit is that this pharmaceutical company who, who created or, or sold um, opioids uh, and, and, and is partially responsible for the opioid epi epidemic. Um, this would allow us to be part of that lawsuit and then potentially uh, receive damages. Um, uh, there's no cost to joining. Uh, on, the only cost would be if we win. There would be some legal costs that would come out of those winnings. Uh, so there was really no, um, no reason not to join and several other area districts are joining as well. That's okay. it. Any comments or questions? I just, uh, you know, this in, in uh, speaking to the, the teacher, I know uh, when COVID first hit, I told Diane, I said, uh, and, and I may have told Todd, do whatever needs to be done, we'll fix it later. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of those uh, things where um, you know, we need to fix it. So. Okay. Uh, roll call. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Powers? Yes. Mr. Luke? Yes. Ms. Savage? Yes. Mr. Bynes? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, next, we'll, we'll have a couple of motions here uh, with some relatives. So this, I would accept a motion to uh, approve Steve Devine as a volunteer football assistant coach and Paul Devine as a freshman football assistant coach. So moved. Motion by Ms. Powers. Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Roll call. Ms. Powers? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Luke? Yes. Ms. Savage? Yes. Ms. Devine? Abstain. Motion carries. Next, I would accept a motion to approve Mike Powers and Steve Powers as volunteer MHS football assistant coaches. So moved. Motion by Mr. Smith. Second. Second by Ms. Savage. Uh, roll call. Mr. Smith. Yes. Ms. Savage. Yes. Mr. Luke. Yes. Ms. Powers. Abstain. Ms. Devine. Yes. Motion carries. And next, I would accept a motion to approve Emily Savage at Creekview for Student Council, fifth grade. So moved. Motion by Mr. Luke. Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Roll call. Mr. Luke? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Ms. Savage? Abstain. Ms. Powers? Yes. Ms. Devine? Yes. Motion carries. And now we are to the superintendent items, so I would accept a motion to approve the superintendent items. So moved. Motion Second. by Ms. Savage? Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Okay. Uh, I already talked to you about the board policies that are on for this month. Uh, there's HR items uh, inclusive of supplemental contracts. Um, obviously, we wanted to get those on um, 
and, and we were anticipating, we held those off a little bit to see what would be, um, what our situation would be to begin the school year. Uh, there are some bus bids as well as bus stops. Um, it, also, student teachers are listed. Some colleges are changing their mind with student teachers, so um, they're on for approval, but understand some of those uh, may change as the year goes on. Questions, comments? I would, I would like to point out, we mentioned that on these policies, virtually everything has to do with changes in sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is included now in Title IX, and there is a slightly different definition uh, for sexual harassment that changes some of the procedures and so forth. But within, within this, we have uh, uh, JED, which deals with student absences and excuses, um, and uh, because school is starting, it's important that we have this policy in place before Monday, um, and I think that's why it was, it was included. I would also point out there are a couple of policies that are going to be deleted because of changes in sexual harassment, these now are not applicable anymore. And so uh, they become kind of a housekeeping item of just getting them off. So. And I do, I think you attended the policy committee yeah. meeting. Uh, yeah. yeah, and, and it's, it's not, I mean, we had, uh, Jonathan did send this to us. We had, we had plenty of time to look through those uh, policies. And I think there were a couple of minor wording changes in them. Um, and obviously it's not going to be our, our uh, normal practice to do a one read on policy, but, but in this situation, I, I, I think it makes yeah. pretty good sense to, to go ahead. And the, the, the sexual harassment, there's not really a decision for right. us whether or not we agree with Title IX or how it's written or whatever exactly. it is law. It's a requirement. We, it is required and we need to put the policies in place. Right. And the timeline that our district and other districts were given just didn't lend itself right. to longer study and debate. So. Mm -hmm. Well, if there are no questions or comments, then I would accept a roll call. Ms. Savage? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Lee? Yes. Ms. Powers? Yes. Ms. Devine? Yes. Motion carries. Uh, comments and questions from board members. Mr. Luke. Uh, two quick comments. One, uh, we we really valued our community coffees, and of course they're on sort of pause right now, but we want to try to look into ways of doing it virtually, so we'll be in touch about that so that we can still hear from community members in a more informal setting. Um, secondly, um, I felt a little remiss the last couple months I've been uh, expressing my appreciation to the administration and to the teachers, but I want to also ex express my appreciation to the parents of what the, has been going on and what's going to continue to go on. I know the teachers and the administrators are dealing with this. I have one teacher friend who said she's been teaching 20 years, but this feels like her first year as a teacher. I think it's similar for the parents and you know it's it's never been more true that we can't educate kids without the whole community i know there are parents that are teaching their kids at home that are helping them or even just watching them during the days when they're not coming in the building and i want to say that as a board member i and we represent you as well as all the other stakeholders in this district and we're behind you and we appreciate what you're doing to uh, educate your kids this year and uh, we appreciate your positivity as well. Ms. Savage. Um, this year is going to be uh, extremely challenging, but I think that of all communities, our community is up for the challenge. Um, we've always um, pulled together, um, and this year is no exception. Um, I'd like to say thank you um, for the information on the bus schedules. I know that a lot of people are kind of nervous about um, uh, that whole busing situation, but it looks like we've got pretty much all good news coming from that. So I know that took a lot, lot of hard work. So 
very grateful to those folks. Um, I also wanted to say um, thank you, Diane, for your Zoom conferences that you've been doing with the staff. And I know that had to be an extremely um, challenging <laughs> because there's so many questions coming in on doing something we've never done before. So I um, appreciate you um, stepping out there and um, opening up the floor to questions. So thank you. Uh, a month ago, we voted on a plan, and I said at that time that the success or failure of our academic plan was going to depend on whether or not the community supported wearing face masks, washing hands, maintaining social distance, and so forth. And we've, we've by the governor's uh, scale, we've gone up and we've gone down, we've gone back up a little bit, and so forth. I just want to thank everyone for what they have done to this point to try to control the COVID uh, virus in our community. But I really, I, we really need to bear down. Um, we got word yesterday that athletics were going to be able, contact athletics were going to be able to proceed. I know we're working on uh, trying to figure out how that's going to happen. Uh, and, uh, uh, but we really need as a community to all agree, regardless of what our own opinions are, we just need to do what is right for the kids and uh, wear masks, socially distance, wash your hands frequently, and do all the things that we're supposed to do so that the kids have the opportunities that we all want them to have. So. Well, I just want to say I'm looking forward um, to a great year. I'm looking forward that the kids are going to be able to get back in at least a couple days a week. Um, thank you for the administration, the staff, uh, technology, all of you that have worked so hard to put this together. And uh, I think our kids are really excited to be able to go and interact with each other, even if it's only two days a week, uh, that they will be able to bring, bring back some normalcy to their lives. And um, it's a teachable moment. And I think that we as adults and the parents and everyone can use this to show our children that we can overcome any aspect that pops up in our life uh, that we can overcome it and be better for it. I, I did forget to give you an enrollment update, sorry. Uh, when we left school in May, we were sitting at 5,149 kids. Currently, we're at 5,100 students. Um, that is including 881 students who have chosen virtual school, just to give you a highlight. Um, I did not go back and look at August last year's enrollment. August is a tough month. There's a lot of ins and outs. So in September, I'll give you a better forecast of that. Uh, I also wanted to tell you we are submitting for a technology grant. Um, we're submitting for hotspots for students. Yeah that qualify for free and reduced lunch, as well as uh, hotspots for every one of our buses. Um, that grant is due tomorrow, so stay tuned uh, for that with some funds the governor made available. Uh, I was also going to mention, um, late last evening, the governor released um, the guidelines for extracurriculars. I would be remiss if I didn't mention it does have a 15% capacity limit. Um, so as we think about that, let me just give you some general numbers. I'm rounding uh, Impact Stadium holds 4,300 roughly. Um, that takes us to about 860 people who can attend an event. Um, priorities are gonna be families of those participating in the evening. So, um, we, will, we are working through those issues now. Uh, we have uh, 60 kids can be on the sideline for uh, football. We have nearly 200 people in the band. We have uh, in the neighborhood of 20 uh, cheerleaders or other support people that need to be involved. And um, 
while we wish everyone could come, understand that those are our parameters. I would say the same about Drive Stadium. We worked on capacity rates, and that's more like 60 um, parent or tickets that we can issue, um, in, including visitors. So we just need to keep all of those um, pieces in mind that it really is about letting those kids have that experience and the people who surround them or support them um, be able to attend. So we would ask for everyone's um, patience. We are gonna meet with the health commissioner at 8 a.m. tomorrow, uh, myself and Adam from Fairbanks to um, kind of talk through some proposals we'd like uh, to be considered. So um, we do have a home game uh, a week from Friday. So uh, as soon as we can release or have our plan in place, we'll be releasing that and information on how to um, navigate through that. Um, on a positive note, I just want to thank everyone. I mean, the tech staff has been here till all hours of the night. Uh, teachers have been here preparing all hours of the night. Bus drivers have been working on new strategies. Cafeteria workers, it's been all hands on deck. And every person in this organization is going to do something this year that they've never done before. I mean, all of us at Central Office who have a certificate are on the sub list. So if a building is short because of an illness, we're gonna be teaching classes. So it's really all hands on deck. Um, and I could not be more excited to have kids back in the building Monday. Like, uh, I think there's a, a, while there's some anxiety and anxiousness, there's a sense of true excitement to get school going again. So that's yes. uh, been very positive. Right, I, even tonight, driving over here, I saw some cars at Edgewood, so I'm not, I can't remember if this is Chromebook pickup or if it's a teacher open house or something like that, you know, but it was just, it was so neat to see families with their little kids walking down that drive. Yeah, like, yes. yeah, principals and staffs have been very, you know, using sign up genius to set up appointments to at least yes. have those kids transitioning to a building, be able to see the building, meet right. their teachers. Uh, it's it's been, um, it's everyone's really jumped or rose to the occasion. Might be the right right way to say it, and and that's yeah. been really exciting to watch. So I well I just want to also thank the uh, presentations. Thank Ryan again for his presentation, keeping us up to date on the buses and those situations. Um, and then the you know the safety video that all of our staff saw. I mean, it's I don't know. It's I guess I could just ditto what everybody has said because I do. I am so thankful for our staff. I'm thankful for our parents, um, the leadership that you two have provided to, to get everybody through this and stay as sane as possible knowing that you know you, you just don't know what's going to hit you every single day um, but but the way that everybody's reacting in our district is going to help our students and, and their families have that um, as, as much of a sense of comfort as is possible and, and i also really appreciate the different choices that we've made available to our families so you know the hybrid doing the remote uh, the virtual academy, I mean, all of those, it's just, it's nice to have some different options um, when there's so much uncertainty. So um, I just can't be, I just could be more proud of our district. And with that, uh, I would accept a motion to adjourn. So moved. And I'll second you. Motion by Mr. Smith, second by Mrs. Powers. Roll call. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Powers? Yes. Mr. Liu? Yes. Mr. Savage? Yes. Mr. Vine? Yes. Motion carries, and we're adjourned at 6. 38, 638, thank you.